So uh, thank you uh, to everybody who's on the line. Um, my name is uh, Chris Nemi. Uh, I'm a principal with Energy Futures Group, and um, I am serving as the moderator for this webinar on behalf of the Regulatory Assistance Project. So um, welcome to this webinar. The, the, the topic of the webinar is integrating energy efficiency programs with codes and standards. Um, I want to uh, do a little bit of uh, introduction here, and, and including a few housekeeping matters, and then we'll jump right into the presentation. Um, so first of all, a, a little bit about the Regulatory Assistance Project, or RAP, as they are affectionately known. Um, RAP is a nonprofit organization that is funded through foundations like Energy Foundation and the Climate Works Foundation, as well as government agencies like the U.S. Department of Energy, to provide policy and technical assistance to policymakers and regulators. Uh, this is the fourth in a series of webinars uh, that RAP has hosted uh, with the gracious funding of the Energy Foundation in order to help Energy Foundation grantees, regulatory staff, and others become uh, better informed on a variety of key topics related to energy efficiency. We have today for this webinar a couple of experts with uh, terrific expertise and experience. They have a lot to share today, uh, which we hope you will find useful. Um, I will do the introductions to, uh, to Alan and Richard uh, in just a second. Uh, a couple of quick um, logistics uh, or administrative issues that I wanted to run by first. Um, as uh, some of you may have, have heard, um, this webinar is being recorded. I uh, want to make sure that you all understand uh, for, for your own benefits that uh, the recording as well as copies of the presentation will be made available on RAP's website um, at www.raponline.org. Um, thirdly, uh, uh, we have everybody other than the speakers muted. Uh, there are a fair number of people on the phone and, and more expected still to come. <clears throat> so it would be difficult to try to have a conversation with, with dozens and dozens of voices potentially chiming in. So uh, with respect to questions, um, what we're going to ask folks uh, that folks do is to, uh, to type any questions you may have in the, the message uh, uh, portion of your screen on the, on the, the uh, bottom right-hand side. Um, as the moderator, I will try to keep track of the questions as they come in. If you can hold your question until the end of the, the presentation, which we expect will take about an hour and a half, so we're going to try to leave about half an hour for, for questions and answers at the end, um, that would be fine too. Um, but I'll try to keep track of the questions and then pose them to Alan and Richard um, when they are done with, with their presentation. I will note that we'll do our best to try to get to all of the questions, um, but it's, it's certainly possible that we won't be able to get to all of them. Uh, in any case, um, Richard and Alan's contact information will be on the last slide of the presentation, and they, they would welcome any follow-up that, that folks might have. Um, lastly, I wanted to mention uh, that when you sign out, and we request that you, when you do so, you do so rather than closing your, by closing your browser by, by pressing the X for the, uh, for the exit button, um, you will be directed to uh, a short um, evaluation form, and uh, we would all very much appreciate uh, if you would take a small amount of time uh, to fill out that form so that we can take that feedback and incorporate it into webinars that are offered uh, into the future. So with, with no further ado, let me introduce our two speakers for today. Um, the, the first is Alan Lee. Um, and Alan is a, a principal with the Cadmus Group, which is one of the uh, preeminent uh, uh, energy efficiency consulting firms uh, in the country. He has more than 25 years of experience in the energy efficiency and renewable energy industry, uh, including extensive experience in uh, the development, adoption, implementation, and evaluation of energy efficiency building codes and appliance standards. Uh, for example, uh, while he previously worked at the California Energy Commission, he oversaw the development, development and implementation of the nation's first building energy codes and appliance standards. Uh, also, working in support of the U.S. Department of Energy, he helped with the development of uh, a national residential energy efficiency uh, building code. Uh, and over the years has also conducted uh, numerous impact and process evaluations of codes and standards in, in a variety of different states, uh, including uh, a, a recent uh, multi-year evaluation of the impact of the California Utilities Codes and Standards Program. 
are uh, uh, he's teamed up with with Richard Fazy, who is um, uh, my partner and fellow principal and fellow co-founder at Energy uh, Futures Group. Um, Richard, like Alan, has uh, more than 25 years' experience in the energy efficiency uh, industry. Uh, he is a certified uh, home energy rater and lead accredited professional and currently does consulting work uh, in, in a, a number of different states and Canadian provinces uh, across the continent. Um, Richard helped create and was the founding president of the board of the Northeast HERS Alliance. Uh, he has served on the board of directors of uh, ResNet, uh, the, the national organization that represents home energy raters uh, since its inception, including a term as president. Uh, and uh, uh, several years ago was featured um, on a uh, uh, Dateline NBC story on energy efficiency. He's also won ResNet's Li Lifetime Achievement Award. So um, with, uh, clearly we have some, uh, some, some terrific experts here. So with no further ado, I'm going to ask uh, Alan to, uh, to kick off the presentation. Alan? Okay. Great. Thank you, Chris. Uh, uh, what we're going to talk about today is, I think, a, a very exciting opportunity with a lot of potential uh, related to energy savings, and it's looking at the linkage between uh, energy efficiency codes and standards and demand-side management energy efficiency programs, and I'm hoping that uh, people who are on uh, the webinar today will be able to take away from this some, some good ideas about where the leverage points are, what the opportunities are, and, and be able to uh, influence uh, policy going uh, forward. Uh, the topics we're going to cover, we're covering a lot of territory. Um, we're going to have to kind of cruise through it. But the first thing is we're going to talk about energy efficiency codes and standards, the background, uh, where they come from, what they're about, uh, and talk a bit about uh, what codes and standards programs are um, involved in and re the relationship to uh, rate payer funded efficiency programs, the rationale of why we're even talking about this, why people are interested in codes and standards programs, um, some of the opportunities for innovative linkages between uh, codes and standards and conventional efficiency programs. Uh, barriers, potential barriers or challenges to implementing such programs and then some opportunities and, and pr approaches that have already been implemented uh, in very innovative ways to respond to those. And then finally, recommendations. I, I'm going to kick it off. Um, Richard's going to talk about some of the issues in the middle and then I'm going to uh, talk a bit about the barriers and opportunities, and then Richard's going to wrap up with the recommendations. So going back, looking at the background um, topics, first want to talk about what standards and codes are. For purposes of this discussion, we're really referring to uh, codes as energy efficiency requirements for buildings, and standards, we're limiting those to uh, application to appliances. Uh, standards are developed by actual bodies that have that authority and responsibility. Codes, in turn, are uh, typically adopted and, and then enforced uh, at the state or local level. So standards can be implemented at the national and uh, at the state level. Um, but just for clarification, we're only talking about codes and standards related to energy efficiency today. Uh, so just basically, codes and standards establish a minimum efficiency level uh, for products and buildings and measures that are covered by the, by the applicable code and standard. To get the benefits of, of the code and standard, it's essential that compliance is high, uh, and that's going to be something we'll be talking about more later. Uh, and the idea of codes and standards really goes back to um, their role in energy efficiency goes back to discussions in the 90s uh, related to market transformation, and we think that they are a key component, potentially, of market transformation efforts. The uh, codes on the, build, again, building side, energy efficiency building side codes were uh, initially uh, developed and adopted in California in the late 1970s in response to the um, energy crisis of that time. Uh, since then, they have been adopted by many other states, and I'll be presenting some information on that. There are model energy codes, uh, typically uh, and traditionally ASHRAE, uh, in association with other organizations, have, has developed the uh, codes um, that apply to uh, commercial buildings. And then, uh, typically on the residential side, 
what's now the International Code Council has uh, developed and adopted the International Energy Conservation Code as well as the International Residential Code. Uh, I think just from the text on this slide, it's apparent that there is potential overlap and confusion since um, the, the IECC can apply to both commercial and residential buildings. But over the years, um, some of those things have been sorted out among the different organizations that are involved. And I uh, think uh, a lot of that's reflected in the latest uh, adoption uh, at the federal level of the Recovery Act. Just to give an idea of uh, what's happened in the energy code world, uh, this graph shows trends in the energy use index relative to uh, 1975 for residential buildings and an indication of when different codes came online. You can see there was not much progress uh, from the 80s uh, to around 2000, 2005, but the current version of the residential uh, model code to IECC is a substantial um, energy savings improvement over the prior code, and then the next version is expected to produce another 15% savings. Uh, the Recovery Act um, that was passed a couple years ago was a, has been a major influence on what's going on nationally in terms of energy codes. It set a condition uh, for state energy program funding uh, to be tied to the state's uh, commitment to adopt the ASHRAE 90.1 2007 version and the IECC 2009 uh, for residential buildings or equivalent to those codes. So that's been a major impetus um, that's led to significant advance in code adoption around the country. Part of the Recovery Act was also a requirement that uh, states demonstrate 90% compliance with those specific codes by the year 2017. Uh, and all the states signed up for, uh, for that and in return got uh, funding through the SEP. Just to give you an idea of what um, that means, this map shows uh, expected adoption of the 90.1 uh, 2007 or the equivalent IECC by uh, 2013. You can see that something like 34, 35 states are expected to have adopted the commercial uh, code at that point. And on the residential side, uh, a couple additional states are shown. But you can see there's a lot of, um, a lot of opportunity in the middle part of the country for uh, efforts to encourage adoption of those codes. And in the, in the blue states that are shown there, there's a certainly opportunity per, to push for adoption of even more efficient codes since, since the code, uh, model code development process is continuing. Um, a little bit about the history of energy standards then, those standards that apply to uh, appliances. They were first considered in the early 1970s, again in response to energy crisis to reduce energy use. Uh, the federal government adopted voluntary standards in 75, but were very slow to uh, move ahead and actually implement them. And there was, at one point, there was actually a uh, uh, no standard standard adopted at the federal level, which was finally overturned in the courts, but it preempted the state's ability to adopt um, standards for appliances. In 1987, there were negotiations between public interest groups uh, DOE and the industry and led to the adoption of the NACO, which clearly defined uh, U.S. Department of Energy's role in appliance standards and in exchange for uh, a commitment to develop a schedule of adoption of standards. Um, there was a, a, uh, a portion of the agreement that led to very strong federal, federal preemptions. Um, preemption means that if the federal government is, is in the process of adopting a code or has, then states cannot adopt a uh, standard that is uh, another standard in that area. But states have been very creative about uh, identifying areas where there are still opportunities to adopt standards that are not preempted. So in terms of the um, status of energy standards, the DOE has adopted uh, standards covering about 40 product categories. Uh, states, uh, California and several others, have adopted uh, standards covering additional ones. And the uh, issue of preemption is, is out there, but there's a lot of discussion going on now about ways that uh, the preemption um, uh, factor might be changed. 
Next, I want to talk about the linkage between um, uh, codes and standards and uh, energy efficiency programs and uh, planning that's being done on the part of utilities and other program administrators. Just to give kind of a, an idea of how codes and standards fit in, in, in most cases when planning is done, uh, looking at the uh, future resources and energy demand, um, the existing standards, codes and standards, are factored into the analysis uh, and the energy savings uh, from them are subtracted from the, expect the projected load. Uh, in addition, uh, expected savings from very likely codes and standards are often factored in the forecast. And then potential uh, codes and standards that could be adopted are usually treated on kind of a scenario basis to see what the impacts would be. But the major thing, and this is a theme that's going to run through the presentation, is that codes and standards basically increase the um, level of efficiency in the market and the effect on conventional incentive programs uh, that are being run by program administrators is that it raises the baseline, uh, making it more difficult in conventional programs to achieve energy savings. Um, in, this, in this context, this uh, world in which the forecasts are being done and planning, it's very rare that uh, the program administrator role in supporting uh, codes and standards is taken into account, and we'll be talking about cases where it is. <clears throat> Just to give an idea of kind of how all these uh, different pieces fit together, this graph uh, shows uh, an illustration of how different uh, factors contribute to energy savings. Uh, the program administrator conventional programs are shown at the bottom, kind of trending over time towards more savings. Uh, if the indirect savings resulting from the programs are taken into account, then there's an additional bump in what's being uh, saved in the market. And then in addition to that, I've shown uh, the potential for codes and standards, uh, both those that the program administrators could be involved in, and then those that could be occurring separately, say through the federal government and other entities. Uh, and the, both those two components, codes and standards and the indirect program in, uh, induced savings, could be considered market transformation since they uh, would be expected to last and be permanent changes in the market. But the, there's many interactions here which um, require more time to go into, but the fact is that there's a lot of potential for codes and standards to uh, contribute to energy savings and there are roles for program administrators to be involved, but um, for that to be taken into account, uh, there are many factors that have to be considered. So the interactions between codes and standards and efficiency programs, I want to talk about on the, um, what the demand side management sort of conventional programs can do. They can provide evidence that uh, provides, that uh, lays the basis for support for adoption of codes and standards so that different technologies are in fact demonstrated through a program and then makes it more feasible for them to be adopted uh, as a standard. Uh, they can prepare the market for upgrades to the codes by making builders and manufacturers familiar with the uh, higher efficiency requirements. And by doing things like uh, incorporating training and um, education, uh, can potentially increase compliance with eventual uh, codes and standards. On the other hand, a codes and standards program can uh, prepare the market for uh, more efficient appliances and measures. Uh, the idea from such programs is to achieve uh, market-wide efficiency increases in uh, both new buildings and products that are being sold, so they can have huge impacts across an entire market. But as I mentioned before, um, the downside in terms of program administrators and utilities is that uh, they can decrease the potential for energy savings from conventional programs. And this is just an illustration of that showing that uh, if you start with a, a demand side management program, the, in the energy usage there, if, the, um, if there is no code, the potential savings uh, relative to the baseline are much higher than they are when a code has been adopted. So that's, that's the, the direct impact of uh, codes and standards program potentially on the savings that could be realized from a demand side management program. Um, talking a little bit then about the origins of such programs, um, 
As I mentioned earlier, California has been a leader in this whole area in the 1990s. The investor-owned utilities became very active, uh, recognizing uh, market transformation opportunities and the role that codes and standards could play. Uh, in 2000, they initiated several steps uh, and launched a program to start advocating for uh, upgraded codes and standards. They, they hired contractors who produced uh, codes and standards enhancement reports. Uh, which provide the technical basis to support a standard upgrade or code upgrade. And they actively got involved in advocacy, working with the industry, um, providing information to the Energy Commission that has the authority in California to adopt codes and standards. But in, real, in doing this, uh, the, this turned out to be kind of a, a sleeping giant and people became aware of that there was a potential for large energy savings and uh, going back to the whole issue of the impact on demand side management programs, concerns were raised about what that would mean in terms of savings potential. Um, and there was, at that time, no way for the uh, utilities to receive credit for the savings from, from their activities. So trying to <clears throat> kind of look at the idea of uh, how a program administrator utility might implement a codes and standards program, there's several questions that would have to be addressed. Should the program be um, a standalone program or should it be integrated, say, with the residential new construction or existing appliance programs? What kinds of activities should be included? Um, and these are all things that have been uh, looked at in various programs, including actively proposing and advocating for standards, conducting technical analysis, developing test methods that would be the basis for the standards, working at the national and federal uh, levels, looking at compliance, and then a whole issue of um, evaluation and measurement and verification, which we'll be talking about a bit more. So why, why all this emphasis on expanding um, codes and standards program? Well, just looking at the uh, case of California and recent study that, that uh, we were involved in there evaluating the savings, uh, there is a very large energy savings potential. Uh, the, the program that was supported by the utilities in California uh, saved on the order of 10% of the total portfolio savings. Um, so that one activity by itself uh, had 10% uh, potential out of the total savings. On the other hand, the cost of implementing the codes and standards program was only about a half a percent of the total portfolio cost. So uh, combining those two, the relative cost of um, codes and standards savings was only about 5% of the average for the rest of the portfolio. So there's very large potential savings as well as cost effectiveness. This next graph uh, was um, borrowed from Art Rosenfeld at the California Energy Commission, shows kind of historically what's happened in California. Uh, the ener total energy savings conservation uh, is illustrated at the very top and the factors that have gone into that, um, including the utility programs, price and the market effects. Looking at that total, the um, commission estimated that about 60% of the savings in the residential and commercial sectors were due to cumulative effects of the codes and standards, so a very large portion. Another reason to look at uh, codes and standards programs is the potential for market transformation. I alluded to that before. Uh, Codes and standards are usually permanent. They usually stay in place, and so the savings from them <coughs> can be permanent. Uh, by instituting a pro code and standard program that looks at compliance, which is it's a piece of uh, programs that we will be talking about in a bit, um, you can look at the market and see where there are problems with compliance and then go back and, and deal with them. So there's no guarantee that a code or standard being adopted is going to lead to 100% compliance. So that's an issue um, that, that can be addressed in such programs. And there are plenty of opportunities to leverage other activities that are going on, uh, and we'll be talking more, more about that, but things like the, certainly the um, existing programs and then what's happening at, with some of the regional bodies and at the federal and state level. So with okay. that, I'm going to turn over to Richard. Thank you, Alan. Uh, this is Richard. Uh, Faisy, and I'm going to be talking over the next section here, uh, running through a number of examples that are 
out there in the in the marketplace in programs um, that uh, demonstrate the, the some linkages between DSM energy efficiency programs and codes and standards initiatives. Let's see. So, page down. Chris, do I have ability to to advance the slides? Okay. Okay. Great. So, I'm going to be talking really about two sort of families of of uh, impacts and, and influences here um, that, that demonstrate um, the linkages between codes and standards and, and DSM programs. The first is going to be uh, those that use codes and standards uh, for driving participation in, in, uh, in DSM programs. Um, so that, that's really a, a, group of, a group of programs um, that are benefiting from uh, supporting codes and standards efforts uh, in the marketplace. And then the second group uh, I'll be sort of uh, flip-flopping, the second group we'll be talking about is uh, a, a group of DSM programs that actually support and grow codes and standards. So both, both of these are out in the marketplace and, and exist right now. Um, and there's some, some great examples that, um, that we can take from and, and build off of and, and implement elsewhere. First of all, I want to talk a little bit about just the relationship between these two. Um, and in theory, uh, what, what is to, to, to happen in the marketplace, uh, the interaction between codes and standards, looks something like this, although uh, in reality it, it, uh, it tends to be a little messier. But, um, so if we're looking at, at a graph here of um, the x-axis over time and energy use on the, on the y-axis, in theory, what happens is there's a, um, there's a relationship between uh, the, the code and, and DSM programs that are out there. Um, if if the, the planning is done right and the timing is set up appropriately, uh, an anticipation of, of um, with DSM programs will, will drive down over time as, as the baseline rises, as, um, as it's clear that markets are transformed. Um, the, the, the programs will be changed so that, um, so that deeper savings uh, tied, to, tied to the same level of incentives um, typically is, is how those would be uh, set up. Uh, at the same time, the, um, the, the code, the code uh, is sort of prepared, the, 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 the skids are greased um, for the code to then be ratcheted down as well. As the, as the program transforms the marketplace, um, we, and, and buildings are built to higher levels or standards or uh, appliances or other products are coming to the marketplace, uh, there's going to be less resistance for, um, for changing codes. And so presumably um, the, the codes would, would follow suit. Um, this, the, the time sequence doesn't always occur in, in this way, but it, um, in, in which the, the DSM program ratchets, is de ratchets down and then code follows suit behind that. But in theory, um, they, they, do, they do move along in lockstep, and we'll be talking about some of the opportunities that we see out there that, um, that influence um, both driving the DSM programs downwards and, and, um, and pulling the codes downwards as well. So the first group of, of examples are going to be those in which codes and standards are used to drive uh, DSM programs. Um, one of the ones that's, that's prevalent um, nationwide that many are familiar with is Energy Star Homes. Uh, Energy Star Homes, as a national standard for residential new construction, um, has a lot of innovative uh, and, and direct linkages in a number of different areas to, uh, to local codes. Um, in, in many of these states that, have, um, that, that support Energy Star Homes programs, there are, uh, they offer free code training to builders, subcontractors, and others um, as a way to uh, get training on the code, but at the same time, they use that opportunity where their builders are subs in the room to, um, to sell participation in the local Energy Star Homes program. I'm sure there, there are many more states than this out there, but, but uh, this is a, a clear strategy in uh, many of the states in which we work in, in the Northeast, including Connecticut, Massachusetts, New York, Rhode Island, Vermont, uh, et cetera. As well, we see that um, the portions of the, uh, the new IECC 2009 code, which 
Alan showed a map of um, many of the uh, majority of the states, uh, or something like two-thirds of the states, uh, adopting IECC within a, a couple of years. There are uh, some requirements in, uh, in IECC which will work to effectively drive participation in local uh, new construction programs. Um, the, 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 um, the couple aspects in here which, which um, I think will have a, a direct impact include the, uh, the duct leakage and the air leakage testing requirements that, that are part of the code. Um, these, are, these are new performance um, compliance aspects of the, of the code are new with this, with this version. And um, as a result, builders will likely turn to the local DSM programs, uh, the local HERS raters, home energy rating system raters who support many of these programs, uh, vendors and program administrators for help. Um, while they do so, um, most all, all of these uh, DSM uh, entities, all, all of the, the, the um, players that have an involvement in the DSM program will use this as an opportunity um, to recruit new, new DSM program participants. Or, or if uh, the DSM program doesn't currently do that, there, here is a, a great opportunity to, to grow participation in the program. Um, additionally, uh, um, we, we recognize that there are, probably, there are at least 11 states out there, according to the Residential Energy Services Network, that explicitly allow home energy ratings for code compliance. Um, and uh, so this is another great opportunity uh, to, to use the, the code and use this particular provision of the code to, to drive uh, program participation. Um, uh, in states that, that allow HERS ratings, many of them probably have uh, Energy Star Homes programs or other similar new construction programs. Um, and by offering uh, services for code compliance, that can be also leveraged uh, to, for participation in the, in the DSM program. While, while, while you've got somebody's attention for offering them a, an alternative uh, compliance path to achieve local code, that's a great opportunity to also sign them up for the higher tier local DSM program. Um, Vermont's Energy Code Assistance Center is, is a great example of this as well, offering uh, a hotline uh, for services to help with code compliance. And, and while uh, Wally while got a, a captive builder on the line, uh, talk, talk to them about the benefits of participating in the program, receiving the incentives, uh, and, and then uh, achieving the, the, the savings that result from building that higher level, uh, basically selling up to Energy Star. Uh, another example is what's happened on Long Island, New York. Um, there, um, the majority of the townships on Long Island, 10 of, of 13, have uh, a number of years ago uh, actually adopted the National Energy Star Homes um, voluntary program as code, as, as, as mandatory um, in those townships. Um, that as Energy Star version 2, which is the one that, uh, that's been in, in place until recently, um, changes to version three, uh, the new higher level of, of Energy Star nationally, um, they are making some, some changes on Long Island. Instead of tying it to Energy Star certification directly, they're going to be tying it to a, a specific a home energy rating score. But the, the concept is still the same here. Um, by having that, um, that requirement for, for achieving Energy Star or a particular HERS level, uh, Builders uh, need to identify, find a, a market-based rater in, in, uh, on Long Island and work with them to demonstrate code compliance. Uh, at, the, at the same time, when they're working with those, uh, those HERS raters, uh, they will work to convince builders to, to build to higher levels. Uh, Long Island has an arrangement where there are four tiers of efficiency, and um, and, and the, the raiders are paid directly by the builders in this instance. If they can, if they can convince them to, uh, to go for some of those higher tiers once they, they get their ear because they're, they're looking for co-compliance, there are incentives that are on the table for the builder, and there's potentially uh, more, more marketing opportunity uh, and more services that the raiders can offer the builders. Um, one of the things that um, we will be covering, um, Alan alluded to it earlier, uh, and we will be, we'll be talking about a little more, is the impacts on baseline. So I just want to note this here on Long Island. There's been a decision that um, Tier 1, which is the Energy Star level, um, since 
since Energy Star is code and builders are required to build the code, um, why should the utility and the ratepayers, the utility, be paying for builders to do what's, what's required anyhow? And so the decision they've made on Long Island is that there, there would be no incentives offered for Tier 1 at the, at the base level um, where Energy Star equals code. I just want to highlight this because the, there's, there, there's a different decision, a uh, different policy decision on this same issue um, in, in Massachusetts and California, and we'll talk about that uh, as well. But I just wanted to note that here on Long Island. Um, and with, with, uh, with moving from Energy Star uh, version 2 to the, the, new, um, the, the new version 3, there, there are some challenges. And as I mentioned, they're, they're moving away from Energy Star on Long Island to uh, uh, just a simple uh, HERS score. Um, Massachusetts is another example of, um, of using codes and standards to, to drive the DSM programs. Ma Massachusetts, uh, as a couple of years ago, took a, an innovative approach and um, offered incentives to towns in the state who, um, who became uh, what they're calling green communities. And there are a number of uh, steps that towns need to go through to become a green community. In exchange for being one, there's some, uh, there's some funding and resources along with some recognition. Um, and one of the, one of the uh, steps that, the, that each town had to go through was adopt a, uh, basically a local higher code. Uh, and they're, they're calling it a stretch code uh, in Massachusetts. Uh, this is this has grown over the last couple of years, and there are now 53 towns in Massachusetts that are uh, actually, I, I believe, it's a handful more than that at this point in time. I think it's pushing 60 um, that are that are currently green communities. So what's happened in, uh, with the green communities in uh, in Massachusetts these, they, that that offer that put in place the stretch code um, is that they are requiring a, a home energy rating. Um, to demonstrate compliance with the local code. This, this bar, this code bar, is set higher in each of these towns than it is in the surrounding towns that, that may not be green communities and in, as the baseline for the rest of the state. Um, by doing this, uh, Massachusetts is able to do this because there is an infrastructure of HERS raters that support their, uh, their DSM program there, their Energy Star program. Um, but builders who want to build in these communities need to work with a HERS rater. Uh, again, the same, same model we're seeing with these other locations where raiders are called by builders and they're, they're con they are able to convince them to, to build to the uh, higher standards in exchange for receiving incentives. Um, this is, the, as I mentioned before, in Long Island where they, they said that uh, the, if you're building the code, you should not receive incentives. Massachusetts has taken a different approach. Um, there, the regulators have mandated that the utilities need to offer uh, the, the state, same statewide incentives in stretch code communities as they do everywhere else in, in the state. Um, this was, this is, was done um, as a way to ensure that, um, that, that towns do not have a disincentive for becoming green communities. So uh, regardless of where you build, uh, you still receive the same incentives for participating in the, in the program. Um, and, and the utilities actually receive the same savings relative to the baseline, uh, even though the, in the stretch community towns, the, the code level, the code bar is set at a, at a higher level. So that's a handful of examples of, uh, of, uh, of uh, programs where codes and standards are used to drive energy efficiency programs. I'm going to then uh, turn this around and, and walk through some examples of where uh, DSM programs have, have worked for supporting codes and standards. Um, and, and again, this is that, that lockstep um, moving together uh, d down, that, uh, down the, down the, the you know, energy use bar or, 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 um, and, and one driving the other towards energy efficiency. So one of the, the longest standing and, and probably um, the, the, the examples that, that most have um, have looked at over the years is what, what happened in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, really early on in the 80s and 90s, the Super Good Sense program uh, was sponsored by the four Northwest states and, and was a, um, a, a really a strategic program design that locked together pro, um, the, the DSM program um, and the, the codes and standards there. Um, and and one, one followed the other uh, along, um, really, and, and, and and the the, uh, the theory played out in reality. 
So the um, the focus was on single family and manufactured homes. Most homes in the Pacific Northwest are, are electric heat. Um, they they recently moved to to Energy Star, um, but but still maintain the same consistent DSM um, DSM pull and the code push uh, ratchet strategy, where whereby the the program offered incentives, trained builders, worked in the marketplace to um, to build participation in DSM programs, builders. Part, built to those levels, um, they got to a critical mass, and um, sort of the, any resistance to ratcheting up the code went away because they were already building to the higher higher program levels. Um, the code the code uh, followed in behind, and um, they they moved the the super good sense program to a higher level. They worked with builders, um, moved the market. The code code ratcheted up as the program moved up, and and they sort of moved in lockstep. Um, so the, the one of the long-standing um, outcomes of this as well was the uh, the MAP program, Manufactured Housing Acquisition Program, um, where they have achieved um, that they were they were able to achieve through this uh, mechanism a 50% savings um, over the the um, the baseline for manufactured housing, and really had an impact uh, nationwide as well. And and um, Seeing what could be done in this region of the of the country was an example for the um, the, the federal manufactured housing standards as well. California, uh, as Alan mentioned, has been has been doing this for for a long time, um, have, looking looking together with the programs and um, using programs to support codes and standards. A, a, a good example is the commercial program uh, called Savings by Design. And um, in which is provided design assistance, uh, incentives for the building owner, uh, work strong, closely with the design team, architects and engineers, um, and then provide a number of tools and resources as well. Um, and this is again one of the one of the the, the programs offering uh, the marketplace the the technical assistance, the resources, um, and to get get building to a certain level, and then and then pull the code up behind it. Energy Star Homes, I talked about it um, as an example of how codes and standards um, can be used to support DSM program, but I'm, I'm going to talk about it here as well, where uh, the DSM programs can be used to support codes and standards. Um, and and the, um, in IECC, uh, we see for the first time in IECC 09, the air barrier and insulation component criteria, uh, which, is a, which is a table table in there that um, is basically pulled out of the experience that Energy Star Homes program has had over the last five or so years with the uh, thermal bypass inspection checklist. Um, this was something that Energy Star Homes introduced in version two, basically a, a mandatory checklist of, um, of components of the building that need to be addressed and air sealed and insulation alignment. Um, and as a result of, um, of working that through the marketplace, builders getting used to using it, uh, the, the code bodies felt like um, it was something that, um, that there's enough experience with out there that made sense. They were able to roll it into the code um, in this version of IECC 2009. Um, and so it was uh, through the DSM programs uh, they were able to pilot Pilot this essentially on a voluntary basis, and then and then move it into codes. Um, so I don't expect anybody to see this, but uh, and they don't look exactly the same. But if you, but the but basically the the thermal bypass inspection checklist uh, on, on the on the left has been um, what's what builders have gotten used to, and and sort of the the um, most effective features of that were incorporated into the code um, in IACC 2009. Again, an example on the um, on the standard side, um, uh, moving away from buildings to to, uh, to to products would be the incandescent lamp standard, that, the standards that we're going to see in 2012, as part of the Energy Independence and Security Act of, of 2007. Um, there's evidence out there that this never would have have um, happened, never would have been implemented without a long history of, of programs of lighting programs. That are primarily promoted compact fluorescent lamps. Um, there's there are states who have uh, worked worked on this, um, implemented um, effective 
local uh, lighting standards, including Nevada. The Northeast programs have been um, have been supporting CFLs, um, and and this is really these efforts have really transformed the market enough so that Congress felt like uh, they could actually uh, ratchet up the, uh, the the federal standards around lighting, paving the way for uh, for for federal standards in the lighting arena that had never been there before. Similar sort of um, experience with clothes washers. Um, the, the new modified, uh, the, the clothes washers are rated on a modified energy factor uh, rating system. The, the current standards now use half of the energy, the washing machines that, that comply with the federal standards use half of the energy um, of, uh, compared to what they were uh, pre-standards. And a lot of this is due to all the activities supporting Energy Star clothes washers um, where these programs have been active, at least in the north, northeast, northwest, California, and probably some other locations as well. But, but these programs have, have, have uh, shown a lot of success and really transformed the market. Um, so um, again, so moving, moving back from, uh, from standards to, to codes, uh, and I, I'm going to use, just like I did with uh, Energy Star Homes, going to be used um, using uh, Long Island Power Authority as, uh, as an example of, uh, I talked about before, how, how codes and standards drove DSM programs. In this instance as well, uh, we're, we're seeing the DSM program supporting codes and standards. And um, sim similar to, to what's happened in, in uh, Pacific Northwest and some other areas, due to the through the presence of the, of the program in the first place, uh, the Long Island Power Authority had an Energy Star Homes program, had supported a, um, an infrastructure of raiders, uh, was out there in the marketplace actively promoting the program. The townships on Long Island uh, saw that this, this DSM program existed, and as a result of that, they were able to pass these local ordinances that, um, that ratcheted their local code up, up to Energy Star. Um, without the without the program in place um, and supported by LIPA, um, this the, those activities would never have happened. Um, and I, I think it was pretty clear from um, we did a lot of work on Long Island and talked to a lot of the people in the townships, and and it was pretty clear that um, that that as a, it was a result of having the radar infrastructure and support. Uh, in, in place, LIPA there. It also didn't hurt that uh, LIPA was offering uh, $20,000 uh, technical assistance support um, and infrastructure capacity building support for the towns that adopted the code. So uh, direct correlation between uh, the presence of a DSM program and, uh, and, and code ratcheting up. In Ontario, uh, same sort of story but a little, little different twist. Um, both on the gas side and the electric side in Ontario. Uh, on the gas side, there's, there's a, a strategic um, effort underway where they are wanting to move uh, drain heat recovery technology, or, or um, GFX is, has been the, the, the past name for this, but basically a device that, that captures the waste heat that comes off of showers and, and hot water loads in the house and, and uh, uses that to, to preheat uh, incoming cold water. Um, the Enbridge and, and Union Gas Companies in Ontario have, um, th have put in place um, programs now to support um, the voluntary adoption through incentives of drain heat recovery technology with the goal of introducing this in the code at the, at the next update. Uh, they identified this as an area that, that wasn't addressed by the code. Um, and they came up with a plan for how to uh, how to go through uh, prepare the market and and then strategically um, build support around this and and put it into the code the next time around um, on the electric side as well there is uh, like like in California that Alan uh, laid out there there is a uh, a direct uh, involvement between Ontario Power Authority and the code body there uh, that work to go through this this process of, of innovating, uh, pushing new technology, uh, looking for opportunities for savings, um, accelerating it through incentives in the marketplace, and then supporting the codes that lock lock in those savings behind. Uh, and they've got a cycle there that that is very similar to what California does. A uh, couple, couple more, uh, and then I'll turn things back over to Alan. Uh, the, the core performance programs, which, which have been the, the new construction programs supported by the New Buildings Institute 
over the past number of years, and many uh, many states that operate DSM programs have have um, uh, relied on and 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 used the New Building Institute's Core Performance Program, which is basically a um, a, a prescriptive checklist for achieving uh, achieving high performing buildings. Um, this this was again. Um, be, Utilized and uh, states, uh, architects, engineers, others, builders became familiar enough with it that it um, directly has has moved into um, some of the uh, the codes, both on a statewide basis uh, as part of the Massachusetts stretch code. I talked about uh, the residential side where HERS raters are used to document residential building. The Massachusetts stretch code on the on the commercial side uh, adopted the core performance um, checklist. Uh, directly into it as well. So, um, and, and then parts of parts of the core performance program have also been incorporated, uh, or will be incorporated in the next version of IECC on the commercial side. So, uh, again, uh, uh, programs um, on the commercial side on this time um, being utilized in in uh, future codes. On Massachusetts, Massachusetts is really um, taking uh, California's lead and attempting to. Put in place some um, some provisions that will enable uh, deeper savings and code support. There, um, California, as uh, Alan may talk about, has really um, or will talk about has quite a, an extensive evaluation process in place to document um, the savings that are that are happening there. Massachusetts is taking uh, a less rigorous approach um, and potentially more straightforward. Uh, but looking again at at the whole uh, the whole the whole venue, residential new construction, uh, commercial industrial, as well as products, so codes and standards, uh, Massachusetts is is um, right now putting in place uh, some plans and designs to to tie together their their uh, traditional energy efficiency DSM programs with a, a code, code support aspect, an area that the the the, um, the program administrators have have really not fully gotten into in the past. They've done some co-training. They've provided some uh, some assistance. But this is really a, a concerted effort to um, to put in place a comprehensive plan, in, in anticipation that they will be able to get some savings uh, as a result of doing this work. Um, so they are um, moving through this right now, and uh, probably right in, in the middle of the process. Um, Hiring a contractor and uh, and designing a, a program that really integrates the, the codes and the standards um, along with the DSM programs. So just an example of of what this might look like on the residential new construction side um, would be offering trainings um, for 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 all the uh, those involved in the the code process, um, offering a hotline as well. Um, collecting the data that's necessary to measure and determine. Um, how effective the code is, and how how compliance is happening, how enforcement is uh, is going along. So there's there's going to need to be the, the the regulators need need data to to um, demonstrate that the, the the PAs have had an impact. Um, that hasn't really been there to the full extent in the past. So collecting that as well, and supporting uh, the HERS raters who are on the on the residential side, the foundation for uh, future code compliance. Um, as codes ratchet up, they're going to be more and more performance-based, and HERS radios will, will, will most likely be the, the delivery infrastructure there. Uh, working closely as well with the, uh, the, the, the HVAC industry, um, the Air Conditioning Contractors of America, the local affiliates who are um, a key component and uh, delivery impactor um, on the duct leakage end of things. Uh, duct leakage is, is, uh, is part of the code now. It will become an increasingly uh, emphasized piece of that, making sure that the HVAC industry is trained, has duct blasters, knows how to do duct sealing, uh, works through effective duct design to move them inside the conditioned space. All of those uh, are key components in, in advancing codes. Um, and then supporting the stretch code communities to make sure that there are resources and and that uh, there are additional towns that agree to come on board and offer that that higher level of, of uh, code compliance. 
So um, those are those are the examples of some some examples of um, uh, where codes drive DSM and uh, programs, and DSM programs drive codes. And with that, I will turn things back to Alan. Okay, um, I want to talk about kind of given all the potential benefits we've we've gone over for. Um, implementing codes and standards programs and the interactions with the conventional DSM and energy efficiency programs, uh, what's standing in the way, what are the obstacles and challenges to doing that. And, and before I t go into that, I want to also point out we're really focused on kind of where the opportunities are for um, utilities and program administrators, uh, largely because they uh, already, at least most of them, many of them have mandates to develop um, uh, energy savings or produce energy savings through different kinds of programs, and they also have the funds to do it. So there's a real question of resource allocation, and I think one of the points we want to want to get across is that um, the uh, potential cost effectiveness for programs that focus on codes and standards can be very, very um, good compared to conventional incentive type programs. So I want to talk a little bit about what the challenges are, the obstacles, and then a talk about some of the kind of innovative ways that those may be addressed. One of the very major challenges to um, implementing a code and standard program, say if a utility um, invests in developing technical information, advocating for a code upgrade, uh, it's very challenging to try to assess what the um, energy savings are associated with that. And I'll talk about some of the methods that have been used in a minute, but um, because of the differences, the kinds of activities that are conducted, the fact that the um, impacts don't come for some time until the code is adopted, there are many complications that affect the ability to to apply sort of traditional evaluation um, methodologies to assess the savings impacts. Um, in addition to the activities that relate to code adoption, those that involve um, increasing compliance and, say, uh, program administrators' efforts to support reach code adoption by local government um, are also difficult to measure. And for example, um, if, you, if there is a effort in, in a particular city to increase compliance, then the question is how do you determine compliance uh, compared to other regions? What's the baseline? How do you distinguish the effects of the program uh, from other things? And how do you make a, a, a fair comparison with, um, with what's going on in other, other parts of a, of a state? Um, compliance itself, just measuring compliance is a challenging activity. Um, Compliance uh, is enforced through local uh, code officials typically, uh, and they uh, have their you know, methodologies for assessing the level of compliance. But when it comes to looking at the energy um, savings or the uh, compliance in terms of uh, an energy code, uh, there are many different approaches that have been used from uh, simple checklist to um, verifying the installation of some mandatory measures to doing energy analysis on buildings and comparing the energy consumption to what a um, building that just met code would, would consume. So very, very difficult and challenging. Um, there have been many studies over the years uh, looking at code compliance and just illustrated some of the examples here varying from as low as 17% up to 88% and, and above in some of the more recent studies. But some of that is due to the different ways that code compliance is measured, and some of it is due to um, lack of, of good compliance or variations in the level of enforcement in different, different jurisdictions. The requirement under the Recovery Act, um, I mentioned all the states have committed to adopting the codes and meeting this re the requirement for compliance. That's been set at 90%, and DOE and Pacific Northwest National Lab have developed a methodology for um, determining what the compliance level is. Uh, and it's kind of a, a middle ground between uh, basic kind of checklist and uh, energy analysis. Uh, another challenge in this area is actually assessing what the contribution of a program is to um, 
uh, adoption of a code or implementation of a comply or the effects of a compliance enhancement program. It's uh, it's something that needs to be done uh, objectively so that um, the program administrator, the utility, uh, is, not, is not making a decision about what their contribution has been and what amount of credit they should get. Uh, it's, it needs to be disentangled from the effects of other programs. So if um, uh, energy savings have occurred or if there's uh, a, a code that's being adopted or some uh, program that's being implemented, then the issue is how do you determine and disentangle the effects of the codes and standards program itself from from the other activities, um, and some of the things that Richard talked about. And then I already mentioned that uh, one of the complications in attribution is that the um, efforts to adopt a code may occur two, three, four years before the code's actually adopted. A code adoption process is a long and tortuous one sometimes and um, involves a lot of parties and can involve delays. And so there has to be an ability to assess what's happened in the past and then link it to the impacts of the um, code or standard that's been adopted. Uh, whether or not a local uh, stretch or reach code uh, should receive or whether or not an incentive should be paid if uh, such a code is adopted. Uh, Richard's talked quite a bit about that, and that is an issue as well, and, and something has to be taken into account and resolved. And, and another challenge is, again, going back to uh, what I mentioned several times before, that codes and standards programs can decrease the savings potential from conventional programs. And so there are complications in terms of how the savings targets or goals are developed for utility or program administrator, and those need to be taken into account on a consistent basis. One thing you know, worth pointing out is that if a, a code program is used to assess compliance and it turns out that compliance is not 100%, then the effect on the baseline relative to um, other programs uh, is to um, diminish the, the impact of the code uh, on the savings from the, relative to the program. And that's, that's something that makes it worthwhile to actually look at that, which may be a, a benefit to existing programs. And clearly, implementing a code and standard program um, is not cost-free. Uh, it takes um, some investment and diversion of resources. And until um, there are appropriate cost recovery and reward mechanisms in place, uh, that is a potential obstacle to program administrators getting involved in this area. So given those uh, challenges and barriers, I want to next turn to some of the things that have been done to address them. And first of all, looking at the measurement of savings from programs and attribution. One of the a recent study that was done was uh, for Department of Energy, the Building Energy Codes Program and they try to assess what the impact of that program has been through uh, energy code savings and uh, attribute the um, a portion of that to the activities of the program. They developed a methodology. There's a paper that was put out late last year looking at what the savings were and how they were calculated. They took into account uh, factors such as <clears throat> the amount of new, <clears throat> new floor space that was built, uh, the savings in going from one code level to another and accelerated code adoption uh, influence of the program, both in terms of actual code adoption and what they called implicit, which was really looking at kind of a spillover effect on, on other states that maybe didn't adopt the code, but they actually, um, the requirements and, and standard practice increased. And then uh, looking at the effect on um, en enhancement with compliance. That study uh, showed that for an investment of about $1 on the part of, of DOE and the federal government, the savings that were returned on a cumulative basis was, were about $300, so a very high leveraging of those investments. Um, again, looking at another um, area in which savings measurement and attribution has been addressed, uh, I want to talk a little bit about California. The, uh, over time, the protocol has evolved in California for doing this assessment, and it includes both the uh, effects of codes, so the building codes, and appliance standards. Uh, one of the components is the unit energy savings, so looking at individual appliances, 
estimates were developed of what the energy savings per unit would be, and that was largely based on engineering analysis. At the building level, simulations were done to look at what whole building savings were uh, from an individual from the codes, and there were analyses done on individual code measures. So basically, one of the inputs that had to be developed was what a per unit um, energy savings was. What uh, was then next calculated was the uh, what what was referred to as the potential energy savings, which is just basically the unit savings times the number of units. So if all the units that were in the market, say all the new uh, homes that were built, exactly met the standard, then uh, multiplying the unit energy savings times the number of units would give the potential of the energy savings. But as I mentioned several times, um, that's not the end of the story. Um, compliance is not necessarily 100%. So an adjustment had to be made for a compliance level. That was done on the appliance side by um, collecting field and uh, doing site visits and collecting data via phone um, on what products characteristics were of um, the various products that were covered by the appliance standards. On the building side, there were site visits conducted to assess the construction practices for new residential and non-residential buildings. The next factor that was taken into account was something that we, we referred to as naturally occurring market adoption. Um, and that is kind of equivalent to free ridership. It takes uh, it makes an adjustment for what would have happened in the market uh, if the code or a standard hadn't been adopted, tries to take into account sort of what the underlying trends were in the market, uh, which you know rightfully the program should not get credit for because those savings would have occurred um, anyway without the program. And then the, the next factor, the last factor, is looking at attribution. So out of all these uh, savings uh, that have been adjusted, uh, what proportion could be attributed to the efforts of the, in this case, the utility program in California? And so a set of factors were developed that were linked to um, code adoption or standard adoption. And for each of those, a weight was assigned based on kind of the level of effort that was required to address the factor. And then scores were developed from a, a third-party analysis of kind of the history of the adoption process. And these scores were uh, multiplied by the factor weights to get a total attribution a score that applied to each of the standards. So the last bullet uh, shows that the overall savings that were attributed to the program, then the multiply, multiplication of the potential savings time compliance minus the, the NOMAD, the naturally market, naturally occurring market adoption, and all of that multiplied by the attribution to determine what the proportion was that would go to the uh, utility efforts. Uh, another area mentioned before, which has been an issue in terms of um, implementing such programs, is how to address compliance. Uh, several compliance studies have been done over the years in places like California, Iowa, Massachusetts, and, and many others. They are being done currently under uh, ARA to meet their requirements. So methodologies are being developed and studies are being conducted. Um, I think we're getting a lot of insight into um, how to measure and uh, analyze uh, compliance with, with the codes. On the other hand, very little has been done on the appliance side. Um, it may be less of an issue there given pressure in the industry um, on competitors who aren't meeting appliance standards, but still there's not been a lot uh, of effort dedicated to determining actual compliance with appliance standards. The compliance enhancement programs uh, mentioned earlier are a challenge in terms of figuring out um, what the, um, the savings should be that are attributed to them and, and the um, and the compliance level, there are many uh, or several program administrators are implementing programs in these areas. Uh, right now, there are studies going on in New York and in California and, and other states as well, looking at how to um, analyze the impacts. And then Richard had talk, has talked a bit about the issue of, of providing incentives uh, for compliance with stretch codes. Uh, and in Long Island, the, the response was that uh, the incentive should not be applied um, because of basically the builders meeting a code, but in Massachusetts and in California, in the interest of um, not providing a disincentive to local adoption of stretch codes, the decision has been to go ahead and provide incentives. So the 
sort of broader question then, and most critical probably to program administrators, is how would their efforts be treated in the regulatory framework? So I'm going to talk about three different approaches that have been um, used in the past, uh, certainly not covering all possibilities, but kind of give an idea of the range of uh, ways that have been applied. Um, first is California, and I refer to that as prove it, claim it. Uh, there's a fairly complicated approach. Um, walk through that a second ago related to how savings are determined for the different codes and standards uh, that are being adopted. Um, California in the 2006 through 8 cycle, the uh, CPUC decided to discount the um, kind of eventual savings by a factor of 50% uh, because of uncertainties at that point in the methodology and the ability to get um, adequate data to, to do a, an accurate analysis. The decision has been made to now provide full credit to the utilities for the uh, verified and evaluated savings. In Arizona, the idea has been to kind of simplify the approach to give credit to the utilities, but to not go through all the different steps that California went through and basically define that the utilities can receive up to one-third of the evaluated savings from building energy codes and standards, at least in the case of gas utilities for standards. Um, and so there's an upper limit on what the utilities can receive and to get that credit, they have to demonstrate that they have been active and played a significant role in the adoption process. Uh, it's, not, it's not a guaranteed uh, one-third, and um, the details of how that's going to be implemented have not been fully um, worked out, but it's in process. The next example is um, kind of what's happened in the Northwest, and this is really going back to the earlier discussion about the linkage in planning, between planning and forecasting and energy uh, codes and standards. The uh, process in the Northwest has been very um, collaborative. Many parties have been involved. The uh, Northwest Power and Conservation uh, Council develops a power plan, and in that power plan, the forecast of conservation, they include expected and cost-effective codes and standards. So they factor in the effect of likely codes and standards that will be adopted. The Energy Efficiency Alliance then conducts regional activities to promote and support adoption of um, codes and standards. And then the forecast itself gets readjusted as codes and standards advance. Uh, and in kind of response to that or consistent with that, Oregon has adopted a requirement to upgrade their code every 10, or 10 to 15 percent every three years. Uh, and then uh, finally here, in terms of looking at other things that have been going on to respond to some of the potential barriers and challenges, uh, there are many opportunities to leverage uh, activities that are occurring regionally, uh, across states, and with many parties. I just listed some here, the Northeast Energy Efficiency Partnership, NEEP, Building Codes Assistance Project, uh, Responsible Energy Codes Alliance, Appliance Standards Awareness Project, which has been very active for many years in the appliance standards side, and then the U.S. Department of Energy Building Energy Codes Program. These are all opportunities where uh, different players can, can potentially get involved and um, look at ways to, to leverage activities to look at, take a bigger picture view of energy uh, efficiency programs and how they might link to uh, codes and standards. Another approach that can be used is to borrow from other jurisdictions. This has happened a fair amount on the appliance side. Um, several states have looked at California's appliance standards and um, have uh, adopted them in whole or in part. Uh, so it's another way to take advantage of what's already occurred. And then another kind of final area, I think, is the whole issue of federal preemption related to appliance standards. And that's something that um, people are paying some attention to and kind of uh, e examining the underlying basis for that preemption and uh, the uh, possible opportunities for making revisions in that. Great. Thank you, Alan. Um, so I'm going to wrap up with some recommendations and then turn things back to Chris for, um, for any 
question and the Q&A session <clears throat> afterwards. So there's a series of recommendations that, that come out of uh, looking at the relationship between uh, codes and, and programs. Um, and so the first, first one of these is to, uh, is to incorporate uh, and consider codes and standards right up front in the planning process. Um, I'll, I'll, the, the, slide, the final slides here are organized in terms of uh, talking about the, the planning and the things. We'll talk a little, uh, just a slide on policies and then one on implementation. Um, so on the, on the planning side, uh, treat codes and savings, uh, code and standard savings consistently in the forecast and the plans. Commonly we see uh, codes coming in as sort of an afterthought. Um, or um, in, in many jurisdictions, they're handled by a different agency than the program administrator. Um, and, and in some cases, uh, the, the assumptions and the impact that they can have on, um, on the marketplace and on savings is, is inconsistent across the, the different uh, bodies that have jurisdiction. So, um, so think, think about it uh, on a planning, from a planning process um, and, and put it right up front, um, put in place a consistent, uh, consistent approach in, in the forecast. And, and um, we're seeing many now having some interest in this, uh, which is one of the reasons we're having this webinar, um, in terms of what the impact can be on codes and savings. There's enough example, uh, enough experience out there now, especially from California, uh, Arizona, Massachusetts is coming on board, and others are uh, Pacific Northwest is, is looking at, um, ha has been doing this for long enough so that I think that there is uh, evidence to, uh, to pull from those and, um, and, and pull a program plan into the, um, uh, right up front into the planning process, uh, incorporate it, and explicitly include the links between uh, codes and standards and the, the DSM programs. Um, as well, um, as part of the EM&V effort, which should be done as, as part of the planning process, make sure you know how you're going to account for the savings that accrue as a result of, of uh, supporting these efforts. Um, what, what are you going to need to count um, in order to claim the savings? Uh, plan for that up front, build it into the, the data systems, uh, collect the information that's, that's needed, um, establish those, those methods um, and the measuring techniques uh, right up right up front, um, and and then as well settle on the make sure that you're you're clear on how the the impacts are going to be attributed, um, and part of that also uh, falls into the uh, into the policy end of things. So really, as a um, the the policy almost needs to be in place before you can start the planning process. Um, and you need to ensure that the regulators are, uh, are aware that this is a potential source of savings and are open to, um, to allowing codes and standards to be counted as, as part of savings for programs. Um, so uh, work, working, working on the policy to, uh, to set the stage is, is a key uh, initial um, approach here. Um, so clearly define how the, the different elements go together. Uh, have policy speak to that, um, and as well uh, treat treat uh, the savings that, that come from from both the codes and standards and the program side of things equitably. Um, so, uh, and and then uh, in terms of the attribution, Alan has spoken to who gets credit. Um, need to make sure that there is in place a uh, the, the policies that allow um, savings where savings due. Uh, but with not, without overdue uh, evaluation and effort to get that. So it's really a, um, a balancing act, and, and I think per potentially what Arizona has done was uh, sort of simplify uh, the attribution and the things, but balancing it, ensuring that there is adequate uh, EM&V EM and data collection to back up the credit that, that they're getting for the efforts they put in. Um, so the uh, uh, in, in defining the, the pie and how it will be divided. We're, we're going through some issues in Massachusetts right now, whereby it's not clear who is who has uh, claimed all the savings for code. Um, there, there are the uh, air pollution compliance folks who uh, who have assumed um, some some savings from code efforts. 
Um, and and have, they, have they taken up all the pie, or is there still some slices, some slices left for uh, for the, the PA programs to, to work and, and um, go after that as well, and ensure that we're not double counting at the same time? So clarify uh, where the boundaries are and, and who is working on which aspect of it. Um, at the same time, we've seen some effective uh, impacts by allowing communities to step out ahead. Uh, those that are, are willing to uh, to raise the bar um, will ensure that uh, codes on, an, on a statewide level uh, probably uh, ratchet up sooner than they would have otherwise. Um, there are many states that, um, that do not allow um, any, uh, any changes beyond a, a statewide code level. So work to put in place policies that will allow innovative and progressive um, communities to put in place the stretch code um, provisions. And finally, on the, on the implementation side, um, there are um, many compliance activities that are, need, are going to need to be supported. So plan for these, build them into the programs, um, and, and work with all the players who uh, can potentially help support the, the, the code enhancement efforts. Um, so that would be the, um, on the enforcement side, the, the uh, code jurisdictions, um, the code officials, if you've got a private market um, like HERS Raiders and, and uh, private market code, code compliance um, professionals, work with them as well. Um, put in place the ability to measure and track compliance. You're going to need to work with uh, with the delivery infrastructure to make sure they've got the tools, uh, they've got the systems in place, you've got the data transfer mechanisms to allow the, um, that to be tracked and, and captured. Um, focus on uh, the, the targeted efforts that we've, that we've seen elsewhere um, allow you to find opportunities that have not already been addressed through, through standards or otherwise, like the uh, drain heat recovery system in, in Ontario, um, there are um, some efforts to look at, um, at set-top boxes or televisions that don't fall under uh, particular federal, uh, federal standards. So um, there are some opportunities out there that, that are not, um, not going to be preempted that would provide an opportunity to put in place uh, a local standards. And then finally, um, enhance collaboration amongst all the advocates. Uh, the, the program administrators and all the agencies. Um, as this next slide demonstrates, uh, there are a lot of players that are involved in, in codes. Um, and it is through the collaboration and the uh, cooperation, sharing of information and, um, and working together that uh, there could be, there, there will be uh, a, a, a um, uh, an effective and advanced um, code ratcheting process. So um, thanks to, to BCAP for this slide and, uh, and the, 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 university, the universe of, of codes is, is broad and expanding and there's a, a lot of opportunity here for us all to take advantage of. So with that, I think I'll turn it back over to Chris and, uh, and talk about, uh, uh, address some of the questions. Okay, um, thanks, uh, Alan and Richard, for a, uh, a, a really good um, and detailed presentation and walk through some of uh, uh, a very important topic that uh, um, that has a lot of complexity to it. I think you've distilled it uh, down as, as well as could be in the in the time we had available. Um, we had several uh, questions um, come up uh, through the course of the presentation. Um, so I'll, I'll try to start at the beginning and um, uh, and pose these to uh, to Alan and Richard. Uh, I'll, I'll start by, by noting that the, the first question, I'm, I'm not sure if it was an actual question or more of a rhetorical um, one, was, uh, was articulated by someone who expressed a concern um, that uh, we're talking about utilities as the preferred market carriers for DSM and uh, suggesting that uh, the you know, utilities uh, may be a drag on efficiency rather than, uh, rather than the solution. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll try to take this one uh, myself, and then Alan or Richard, you guys can chime in if you have anything else to add. I, I think the the um, uh, there was Alan and Richard made an, an intentional effort, um, as often as they could, to uh, to use the term program administrators 
um, rather than just utilities to, in, in recognition of the fact that in a number of different states, it's not the utilities who are administering uh, efficiency programs, rather uh, the responsibility has been given to somebody else. Um, needless to say, in all of those states where that's happened and in many others where it hasn't, uh, there's been a, uh, uh, you know, a hornet's nest of a debate um, about who, who's the right entity to deliver these programs. Um, we're, the, the purpose of this presentation was not to, to get into that hornet's nest, uh, but simply to, uh, to make the point that whoever is administering the efficiency programs, whether it's utilities or somebody else, um, it's important to think about uh, the interplay between those programs and uh, efforts to, to promote codes and standards. Alan or Richard, do you have anything to add to that? Does that make sense? Well, I would, I would just comment uh, that um, you know the utilities in California are investing I don't know how many billions of dollars in, in energy efficiency programs currently, but the uh, you know the the relevance of what we talked about is where those dollars should go, and uh, I think that there's a pretty strong case that codes and standards activities can be very cost effective. So um, I think that's uh, you know something that needs to be taken into account in decision making of uh, of whoever is implementing energy efficiency programs and looking at this as a real option. Okay, good. Um, the the second question that came in, someone asked uh, if you could, uh, and this may be for Alan, comment on um, net savings versus growth savings in the context of what's happening in California. Uh, first for the three-year plan from 06 to 08, then in the 09 bridge year, and then in the, the current three-year uh, plan for 2010 to 2012. And uh, you know, that's another uh, potential hornet's nest of a conversation, uh, but I'm, I'm assuming that the question is particularly in the context of the codes and standards components um, of, of those, uh, of those uh, utility filings. So do you, do you want to, can you say anything, Alan, about the, how net savings versus growth savings is being addressed with respect to the utilities uh, code and standards uh, promotion efforts? Sure, and, and I kind of alluded to that in the discussion. Um, we, in the process of doing the evaluation, we kind of in, invented, not invented, but we, we applied some existing terms to different places in the process uh, where they had nobody had really kind of investigated that before, but you know, we started out with what we considered to be the potential you know, maximum savings numbers, and then adjusted those uh, by the compliance rate to get the growth savings, which is kind of comparable to what's done in conventional programs. And then the net savings were really uh, based on all the, the adjustments that were made after that, uh, and including the effect of the NOMAD or the naturally occurring market adoption to try to net out the um, amount of savings that would have occurred in the market without the program. So it's it's that's one of those areas where analyzing a codes and standards program kind of diverges from uh, from a conventional energy efficiency program. But um, but I think you know what we wound up in the end was a was a net savings number. And uh, but it's not something you can do the conventional comparison to come up with a net to gross. So. Okay. Um. Let's see, we had a question from, uh, from someone in a state uh, uh, where they don't think that they're, uh, uh, or are concerned that the statewide program evaluator would, would not likely, uh, currently anyway, approve um, and or verify savings from working on codes, and wondering whether there were any uh, protocols in place for, for M&V for, for promotion of codes and standards that, that might be written, um, you know, written templates or protocols that others uh, could potentially borrow. Alan or Richard, are you guys aware of, of any uh, uh, any documents that that we might be able to um, uh, direct people to? Uh, go ahead. Yeah, Richard. Okay. Well, I'll just I'll just comment on the California one since there there is a very thorough protocol for evaluating the code and standards uh, program, at least the advocacy program. Uh, what what's not been fully flushed out is the other potential pieces like compliance enhancement and and the reach code influence. Um, but other than that, um, I, I'm not aware of any specific protocol. Richard, I, I don't know if you are. No, I'm not either. I mean, the only thing I was uh, point out, and I did see in the messages going by that um, that, that uh, Jim O'Reilly from NEEP had had put the link in there for the workshop um, on this issue. 
that occurred last fall, and um, there were some a number of resources that were pulled together as, as part of that re workshop that are probably on the NEEP website. But in terms of uh, proto existing protocols that can be lifted and, and uh, transferred elsewhere, I'm not aware of anything. I, I think the, the reality is that there are only a handful, and that may be even too strong, uh, only a few states that, that have uh, ventured far enough down the path that they're actually trying to figure out what those protocols ought to look like. And um, so we're, we're kind of at the, the beginning phases of this process. Is that, is that a fair conclusion? Yes. Okay. Um, so, so hopefully, uh, you know, perhaps in a year or two, we'll have, uh, we'll have templates that other folks can, can borrow. Uh, we had a question that someone was asking, uh, I think Richard and Alan, you guys both referred at various points during the webinar to, to baseline studies, and someone asked whether you were referring to uh, DOE's BECP pilot studies, uh, and, or presumably uh, uh, by extension, or are you referring to something else or some combination of the two? Um, I, I, I'll, I'll take a crack at that. I believe that the question had to do with the uh, number of um, uh, there are some percentages on uh, one of the on the, one of the particular slides. Um, slide 47, I think. Slide 47, right? That, and those those numbers on there, I'll, I'll just I'll just read those off. Um, uh, may, th these these were um, the the bottom line result of code compliance that came out of baseline studies in a, a handful of states um, that looked at characteristics of new construction. Um, in preparation for putting in place a residential new construction program, and as part of those studies, uh, ran uh, those those uh, homes through some software to determine whether they met. Um, in in most all of these cases, uh, it was through REM rate to determine whether or not it uh, met the local um, code compliance levels using the performance. Um, the performance report that came out of REM rate. And so the results were in 2008 for Maine, uh, only 17% of the homes in the baseline study uh, showed compliance with the, with the code in place at that point in time. For the Long Island Power Authority, the 2004 study showed a 25% uh, compliance rate. Uh, in Vermont in 2009, the study showed that 72% of the homes in the, in the study met the uh, local energy code. Uh, and in California in 2002, 88% of the homes um, showed compliance with the local code. So those, those are all just in the context of Alan's discussion about uh, the ERA requirement that, that states demonstrate 90% compliance um, by 2017. And I believe that, um, that none of those, all of those studies were funded by either the state governments or the utilities rather than by the federal DOE. Is that true? That's true, and they are not, none of those are using the current PNNL um, energy compliance checklist approach, which Alan mentioned is underway right now, and at least in California and New York. Other states may be using um, those checklists as well. But there, there, there are at least a half a dozen ways to answer the question. Um, what is the percent compliance for new construction? And so depending on which path you take, whether you do a, a model performance approach or whether you look at the UA approach or you do the, um, the PNNL uh, or, or DOE building codes uh, checklist approach, um, that, that answer will vary significantly. But none, none of those studies did use the, the current uh, PNNL approach. Okay, well, thank you. I, I would just, I'd like to add one thing to that too, and I didn't mention this in, in my presentation, but uh, the, for establishing a baseline for, say, a residential new construction program, you need to go out and, and collect data on what's being built. And so in California, we were able to um, leverage that information. It was a baseline study for purposes of looking at the savings from residential new construction, but it also uh, provided the information on uh, compliance rates with the code. So that's a that's an area where uh, you know something can serve a dual purpose, and so you don't have to go out and do a totally independent study just to support codes and standards. Good yeah, point. I, I believe that was that was true for all of the other studies that that, uh, that Richard mentioned as well. They were all done to serve multiple purposes. Yeah, in fact, right. the primary purpose in all those was to establish a baseline. And while we were out there, we we ran you know they they ran code compliance 
right. um, yeah. uh, test at the same time. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, next question. Someone asked whether there are uh, any examples of utilities getting savings credits from uh, convincing or helping communities to adopt uh, stretch codes. And if so, how are the savings that they're getting uh, credit for uh, being estimated? I, I can address what's going on in Massachusetts, and maybe you can talk about California then, Alan. But then in, in Massachusetts, um, uh, by default, the program administrators are, uh, are claiming savings for the um, supporting the efforts in stretch code communities because um, the, the baseline of Massachusetts, as we talked about, um, is statewide. It's not, it's not at a higher level for stretch code communities. And um, by default, um, those builders that are building new homes are working with, with raters. Um, and most likely, the, uh, even though there are a couple subtle differences between the stretch code uh, the, uh, compliance level and the, uh, the, the, the PA-supported Energy Star Homes program, by all intents and purposes, they're at the same level. They're, uh, 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 they're pretty close. So most of the time, in order to get the incentives that are available, the builder will do the couple extra things to comply with the, the program requirements. Um, they will meet the stretch code requirements. They'll meet the, the statewide Energy Star Homes program requirements, and the utility will claim the savings from the statewide baseline. So by default, the, the PAs are, are claiming the savings through that mechanism in Massachusetts, even though there is not an explicit policy for, uh, for code savings attribution um, yet. Yeah, and, and in California, uh, there there is not a, uh, a methodology yet or a, a framework for doing that, but it's in discussion, and uh, it will be applied in some way to uh, you know what happened in the previous cycle, but uh, it's still in development. Okay, great. Uh, the, the next question um, had to do with the, the level of resources and sophistication required to, to make this all happen. Um, they, the, the, the person asks whether there are estimates of the amount of staffing resources that program administrators need to commit uh, to these uh, codes and standard support uh, efforts, and whether um, that work is typically done in-house or whether they bring outside um, expertise in. Um, and uh, they, they want to understand <coughs> thinking specifically about California's uh, uh, case studies because uh, one would think it requires a lot of expertise. Uh, well, I can talk about the California case. Um, the utilities there are working uh, jointly together, all the investor-owned utilities. They have consultants that provide uh, technical support and analysis, and they've kind of carved up each utility taking responsibility for a certain area uh, of, the, uh, of the program. Uh, the, those case reports that are being developed um, I don't know the exact budget or cost of them, but they're, you know, a few tens of thousands of dollars each, depending on the on the scope. Uh, but typically, the utility has um, each utility has two, four people involved, overseeing their efforts, and then they uh, use a lot of consultant support to get the technical work done. But they, the utility staff, spend a lot of time. Um, on uh, like weekly conference calls talking about things like the next round of the standards or what's being done at the federal level or uh, conferring with the Energy Commission on what good opportunities are for the next um, uh, set of upgrades. So, you know, I think staff or um, the utility staff, there are, I'm sure, a, a couple FTE um, dedicated to, to the effort and then a lot of the technical work is being done uh, under contract. And I can speak to Massachusetts, um, where Massachusetts um, uh, has basically uh, has hired one of the, the, the major utilities there, hired a full-time staff person actually from California um, to support the codes and standards efforts across CNI and uh, residential, um, including codes and standards. Um, but they, um, so they've done some planning work internally initially, but um, they've recently put out an RFP and are about to make a decision on a, on a contractor to do all the planning work for Massachusetts, um, not any of the implementation work, just the planning work, and then they'll turn the implementation back to the PAs and their uh, lead vendors and, and contractors otherwise. 
Okay. Um, very good. So uh, next question. Um, someone asked what, Alan and Richard, what your thoughts or opinions uh, would be on giving utilities some level of credit for, uh, for uh, advancing code compliance um, if current compliance uh, rates are not high and that other ways to get to compliance um, are politically or otherwise uh, not very feasible, like uh, you know, addressing issues of, of inadequate uh, funding for, for code officials and local governments? Well, I certainly, uh, I mean, I think that's that's one of the themes of uh, what we were talking about, that um, that the compliance enhancement, how, however it's done uh, through support by program administrators and utilities, uh, you know, is something that, that's very critical. And I think it, as long as the case can be made for savings resulting from that uh, through increased compliance, then uh, it makes uh, good sense to you know, provide uh, credit to the utilities similar to, to other programs. I, I agree. I, I think that that is the key uh, aspect that the utilities can provide in supporting codes and standards and justify claiming savings for it. Ba based on, on some of the low compliance rates we've seen out there uh, from the handful of baseline studies that have been done, um, the, uh, I think there are a lot of people that are banking on the fact that you've got a code in place and so everybody complies with it. The, the evidence is, is otherwise. And um, by the, the PAs or, or the utilities, if they're running the local programs, can demonstrate that they've uh, ramped up compliance rates, uh, I, I certainly think that they're justified in claiming savings for those efforts. And are, are, um, are there any examples today uh, where utilities are getting credit for advancing um, code compliance? Is that, is that part of the, uh, or is it still in the, in the developmental stages? Well, in Massachusetts, it's certainly at the top of the list, but it's still in development. Um, I'm assuming it's Cal California the case, Alan? I, I, uh, it's, it's similar to the stretch code. It's something the utilities have developed a, a code and compliance enhancement program and it's being implemented, but how it's going to be assessed is, is still being defined. Okay. Um, someone else asked, <clears throat> related to this very topic, um, whether in the, in the jurisdictions where this is being debated, um, folks are questioning for, for whatever reason whether the utilities or, or non-utility program administrators should be in the business of, of enforcing codes. Is there any, are there any kind of philosophical arguments against this that have, that have come up? I can tell you that none of them want to do it, so I think that's kind of where they started. They don't they want, don't want to get into that. At least my experience in California. Uh, so the uh, I, I think other ways to get at it are providing support uh, for staff who could be uh, working with the building departments. Uh, you know, pro pro supporting other things like circuit writers and and stuff like that. But as far as getting in and actually doing code compliance. Um, Utilities are very reluctant to do that. It's, I know that in some cases, um, through programs like uh, um, Energy Star and the HERS ratings, uh, I know that some code uh, jurisdictions have accepted those uh, as uh, showing compliance. So it's kind of through the back door, but it's not putting it's not putting the sort of legal requirement on the uh, building department or on the uh, utility. I know that, that Efficiency Vermont um, a number of years ago um, was, since Vermont is unique in that there is not a, a, a robust code compliance infrastructure in place, Efficiency Vermont was uh, providing some uh, code compliance um, sort of uh, enforcement as well as trying to offer voluntary programs and ran into some, some problems from the marketplace. Uh, perceiving uh, some mixed messaging and um, d didn't like, uh, didn't didn't feel like they could open up to uh, Efficiency Vermont for for incentives if they're also going to be the code police. So it was it was a challenge <coughs> to wear both those hats. Yeah. <clears throat> and there was a, an innovative program done in Washington State in the 90s where the utility group got together and uh, kind of provided incentives and the training uh, of third-party inspectors 
and you know fairly rigorous requirements and certification, and then a lot of the code uh, jurisdictions use those people to do <clears throat> to do uh, code uh, enforcement, but it wasn't the utility staff uh, going out and doing that. Okay. Um, so clearly, clearly a challenge there, probably more than anything else, from the um, from the utilities uh, potentially assuming a couple of different roles. Uh, we had a question about uh, utility attribution, uh, and Alan, you touched on you touched on this uh, a couple of times. And the, the question is, um, what is the uh, you know if you if you had to pick a low range and a high range, um, you know what is the the range of of, of uh, in percentage terms of attribution for uh, for improvements in compliance or other aspects of codes and standards uh, savings that are generated that you are seeing out there. Um, with respect to how, you know, how much utilities are allowed to claim, uh, uh, I, I know you. I think you gave the example in Arizona. It was about they were they were capped at uh, at one third of the savings. Are there are there? Can you touch remind us what the other um, percentages are in other jurisdictions that are addressing this? Well, I mean, the only place where it's actively happening is in California, and the uh, we went through the exercise of. of Calculating what the attribution was for each of the codes and standards, and typically it was uh, 60 to 80 some percent, uh, and that was largely because the utilities were very selective and they targeted areas. They took the lead for it, um, and you know, looking on balance at where uh, the resources came from that led to adoption of the code, um, the, the bulk of them were coming from the utility efforts. So it's it's in in California there there isn't there hasn't been a fixed um, attribution value rather it's been determined after the fact through uh, some sort of evaluation process. Right. There was uh, yeah in the current protocol uh, you know each each measure is being evaluated each standard is being evaluated uh, on a standalone basis um, and it's it makes it. Complicated, I, you know. I that's kind of one extreme, but I think there's there's good reason to do that too because their um, efforts may vary um, across the different codes and standards. Okay. And do you think that the um, do you think that's the best? Do you guys have any comments on whether that's the best approach to, to to determine this after the fact? It sounds like Alan, what you said is one of the one of the reasons that the attribution in California was relatively high is because the the uh, utility program administrators did a reasonably decent job of, of picking the targets that they were going to focus on on carefully, um, so that in, you know perhaps they were going after certain areas where the enforcement was lower, where the opportunities were great. Is, is that the best way to go, or do you prefer um, something that's uh, that's simpler and more prescriptive uh, up front? And, and would you? And is your answer different in a? In a? Would your answer be different for a state uh, or a utility that's facing a, um, you know, uh, an energy efficiency uh, resource standard or some other mandated mandated savings requirement? Well, I, I guess I don't have just a single answer to that. Uh, I think it depends on the situation. I, you know, I think what uh, one of the things we kind of ran through our presentation too is that there were opportunities to leverage what's been done. So I don't think like on this uh, in terms of appliances or building codes that uh, a, a utility in another state other than California or or the state itself would have to start from scratch in developing an attribution methodology. I, I mean, it's certainly it all has to be constrained by resources uh, that are, you know, available to the the regulators and to the program administrators, and so I think the the right answer probably varies by situation. Okay, Richard, do you, do you have anything to add to that? Well, the the, the thing I would add is that um, I, I believe it's twenty something evaluations that are done in California to determine attribution, and and I would suggest that that um, states. With with a smaller evaluation or DSM program budget would not have the resources to, to pull that off. So, so maybe there's uh, a, a simplified approach that would cost less and be less complex to achieve a similar result. In okay. theory, um, I think we had one other one other question. Uh, oh no, here's another one who's come, which has come in. Um, 
have program, program administrators considered uh, seeking credit for uh, legislative efforts. Uh, for example, if you were successful in, as a as the, uh, program administrator in getting your your legislature to adopt a, a more stringent code or standard, um, uh, are, are utilities potentially or other non-utility administrators potentially able to claim credit for that? Interesting. <laughs> I, I haven't seen that, but that seems like a potential uh, a potential impact. Yeah, I, I think so, and it depends. The process for adopting codes varies by state. I mean, California has the Energy Commission, which has the authority and responsibility to, to adopt building codes and appliance standards, but in other states it's, it's done legislatively, and even in California it's sometimes it's done legislatively. But I think the same argument could be made there, uh, that if the PAs are involved in, in supporting that, then uh, could make a case that they should get credit for the savings. Right, and the, the, the trick there will be will be figuring out how to um, how to measure the effectiveness of each of the different uh, stakeholders' lobbyists. Okay. Um, one one other one other question came up since we're all still looking at this uh, slide of the universe. Uh, someone uh, uh, very appropriately observed that um, utilities are nowhere to be found on this on this list. Yeah, I thought that was a, I thought that was a good observation. I'm, I'm wondering if that was uh, intentional or not. Um, we can't answer. We don't own the slide, so. Um, but certainly, um, maybe historically, they they haven't played a role on it. And but going forward, they probably do belong on it. Okay. Um, uh, I think that's it. I haven't seen any other uh, questions come up. So. Um, and we're, we're just a few minutes before the end of the, the, the two-hour session in any case. So uh, I think we'll wrap up and, um, and say, uh, uh, you know, very big thanks to, to Richard and Alan for an excellent job in walking us through uh, this, this very interesting topic. Um, I'll reiterate that uh, Richard and Alan's uh, contact information are on the slide, uh, are on the last slide of the presentation. Uh, and uh, you, you all are uh, welcome to follow up uh, with, uh, with them if you should so desire or something else occurs to you after the fact. And in case you can't write really quickly uh, to get their, their contact information uh, down, I'll remind everybody that the, um, the presentation here was recorded and uh, uh, it will be uh, uh, put on RAP's uh, website at www.raponline.org. Um, shortly, so that you can you can go back to it uh, or refer other folks to it. Um, so B thank both, both both the presentation and the recording, Chris. Yes, they will be together. So uh, uh, with that, I will say uh, again thanks to everybody. And um, uh, one last thing before you leave, a reminder to uh, as you click on the X button for exiting. Um, if you wouldn't mind, uh, you will get a, uh, an opportunity to, to do a very quick um, uh, survey monkey uh, uh, evaluation of the presentation today. Since we've got, we're finishing five minutes early, we'd really appreciate if you would do that and give us uh, uh, whatever constructive feedback um, you could. So uh, with that, I will uh, stop the recording and say uh, thanks and sign off. Thanks to everybody.